So very happy and fresh morning to all of you. Uh, while the delegates are slowly pouring in, we'll get going because we are already 10 minutes behind the schedule. Uh, without much ado, let me invite uh, chairpersons of the first session of today's program, uh, Lower Unit Act Dysfunction 2019, Professor Venugopal and Dr. Anish Rivastav, Chairman BOE USI, to start the proceedings. Good morning, all of you. I think we are already 10 minutes late, so let's get cracking and going ahead with the program. Paul Abraham needs no introduction to this group. Most of you over here yesterday would have seen him actively instructing you all on how and when to perform Eurodynamics and what are the various ways of getting uh, the program going at your center if you are so interested. I think most of the important thing is I think he, he is going to review the what has happened yesterday and give us some feedback on what he thought the whole program was uh, that happened yesterday. I invite Dr. Paul Abraham to uh, Good morning and thank you very much, uh, Professor Venugopal. As I say, it's a, a great privilege to be here and uh, I'm very grateful for all the preliminary discussions that um, I had with uh, Professor Chowler to plan this and of course with the Secretary of the USI, which is also very important. So it was a privilege to um, deliver the course yesterday with uh, the, uh, my, other, my colleagues, uh, the first course between the USI and the Bristol Urological Institute. So we've been doing these courses now for uh, a great number of years um, and we were flattered that the USI was interested to see what the courses looked like. So this is a very brief report of, of what we were up to yesterday. I must say, I think, I would say, uh, on tourism posters, you should have marvelous Manipal. It's a, it's a lovely place, and I uh, enjoyed uh, walking around the campus. It's a beautiful campus, and uh, that, was a, that, was, that was fun. The wonderful thing about India, of course, is the culture, and then I was taken out uh, by Akshay here, who's been my minder for two days. Thank you, Akshay. Uh, we've not got lost. And we went out to this very beautiful Jain temple, which was simple and very spiritual, I thought. Uh, over 500 years old, a remarkable statue here carved from a single piece of granite, 60 feet long, 15 feet under the ground, and 45 feet above the ground, uh, carved in 1432, such, such culture that you find in this country. So. Um, I, I've paraphrased somebody who we are not as fond of as we used to be, and that's Tony Blair, because he, he made a lot of noise and it didn't necessarily, like all politicians, make a lot of noise, don't they? It doesn't necessarily come to anything. And he famously said in 1996, before he was elected prime minister, he said, ask me my three main priorities for government, and I tell you, education, education, education. Actually, the education system's probably worse today than it was in 1996, but that's politics, isn't it? Fortunately, we aren't politicians. We can be true to ourselves, uh, we can be intellectually honest, we can tell the truth. This seems to be something that politicians find impossible. I think, actually, politics in India seems a lot more organized at the moment than politics in England, which is completely chaotic with this Brexit, which you no doubt look at and think, how on earth can you run a country like that? Well, the fact is, they have not run the country for the last three years because they've been completely obsessed with trying to square a circular argument, which is why it goes round and round. Anyway, the three of us feel that we would say about what we do, education, quality, and improve patient care. So I think that was the message, really, uh, from, from yesterday's course. And here was the, here's the program. And uh, Professor Sinner and I delivered the lectures. And we had um, 
you can see he's very good at lecturing, Professor Sinner. Here he's, he's lecturing my daughter and her husband and myself. No, actually he was telling a funny story. He wasn't lecturing. Um, and as you can see, they're all laughing. Um, so it's nice to come again and meet so many old friends. So we delivered these lectures yesterday. And I think just a statement of fact, there is an issue with Eurodynamics today, everywhere, not just India, certainly in Britain. Quality is very variable, and this problem is worldwide. And I've been uh, with one of my colleagues looking at worldwide Eurodynamics over the last three years. And even from wonderful North American centers, the Eurodynamics can be terrible, uninterpretable. But they send them in, they obviously think they're okay. So you cannot make any assumptions that any particular country is delivering good Eurodynamics. And one of the sad thing is, is that there's no mandated training. So if you're a radiologist, or if you're measuring serum creatinines in a laboratory, certainly in the UK there will be inspectors who will come in, make sure everything is safe, and that you're measuring things accurately. This is not the case for Eurodynamics worldwide. Anybody can set themselves up in an office, uh, in the corner of a, uh, a shopping mall or something, and they can start doing Eurodynamics in any country, as far as I'm aware. Certainly in Britain, I think in India, uh, in the States. You can do what you like. Of course, the patients don't know this. The patients all think that we are superbly educated in Eurodynamics, and that is not the case. So, in no country is there any system of regulation or accreditation certification. And in no country is there a curriculum for what you should teach in Eurodynamics. So, we started yesterday, hopefully, uh, with a system which can be used um, throughout India. We've just published a new document which is about the minimum standards for Eurodynamics. And this is the first time that such a document has been uh, produced, and this is now available if you are subscribed to Neuro Urology and Eurodynamics, or if you're a member of the ICS, then you can get access to this document. It's a bit long, and it's quite wordy, because obviously we felt we had to, we had to write everything down. And it goes, through, it goes through things like aims, principal indications, minimum standards, and I'll let you just read through this list. I'm not going to read it, but you can see that it's quite comprehensive uh, and talks about the patient pathway, uh, all the different urodynamic techniques, and then this is an English thing, uh, guidance for people who buy the services on behalf of the population. So I thought I'd just go through some points, and the general aims of the document are to guide clinicians who are doing urodynamics and of course to improve the care of patients by providing these minimum standards. So it's just like building a car or hopefully building an aircraft until recently we, were believed, we believed there were minimum standards that guaranteed our safety uh, in an aeroplane. But it provides a framework for best practice for the first time. And one of the points that came up yesterday was that the standard of referral into Eurodynamics is often quite poor. And we've, we believe exactly the same thing in the UK, that you get this, somebody, please do Eurodynamics. And the clinician who's referred the patient hasn't really thought in any depth about why he or she wants you to do the Eurodynamics. So we have said that the patient should be appropriately referred with adequate cl clinical information and as a statement as to how urodynamic testing would benefit the patient. And of course that bit's often left out in the referral letter. So what is the urodynamic question? So for example, in an older man, it might be, is there evidence of prostatic obstruction? And are there any features like detrusor overactivity that might mean the patient doesn't have such a good outcome? Similarly, in women, it might be this woman is complaining of stress incontinence. Uh, can you confirm that she has urodynamic stress incontinence and there is no detrusor underactivity that might mitigate against her being able to pass urine properly after the operation? These are things that patients want to know about and we want to know about. So I think we, 
we'll try to get people to refer uh, more accurately. And obviously, a uh, key to it is that the test is safe and of high technical quality, and the people who look at the trace can actually interpret it. So those were issues that certainly came up uh, yesterday. What we thought about really, I think for the first time, we, for us to think about it at least, were that when you do urodynamics, there are actually two sets of skills. One is a technical set of skills, and one is a clinical set of skills. Now, I know from our 20 excellent candidates yesterday that almost all of them work with another person, usually with a nurse. So, in practice, it tends to be the nurse or the technician who has the technical skills. In other words, they can work the machine. I can no longer work the machine, but I consider that I have the clinical skills. The technicians and nurses I with work with can work the machine. And if I say, well, that doesn't look right, can you fix that? They know how to do it. So I, I, don't, I don't bother about that anymore. Maybe I should. So there are these unique uh, technical skills. So it's needed to run the technical aspects of the aerodynamics uh, to, a set, uh, to an excellence level. And this could be a technologist, a nurse, a clinical scientist, or a doctor but it is a separate set of skills about how you check the calibration, for example, things like that, that some of us don't think about and don't, maybe don't know how to do. Well, that's okay. It doesn't matter that we don't know how to do it as long as the person we're working with does know how to do it. And then you've got the clinical skills, which is obvious, how to assess a patient, how to look after a patient, how to talk to the patient uh, during the aerodynamics. But again, this might be a nurse who does it. And some of you I know in India have extremely skilled individuals who do your urodynamics with you, who are capable of the clinical bits as well as the, t as well as the technical bits. That's okay, but of course, these are individual cases. And this person, I, I'm thinking particularly of, of, of a couple of colleagues here who have highly intelligent people who work with them, who've worked with them for 20 years, who are really good. But to get a new person like that is very difficult without any formal training process. So the clinical skills can certainly be from a nurse, a clinical scientist, or a doctor who's been trained. But we're suggesting that they should be trained to some standards with a curriculum. So in terms of the patient referral, often the patients will come to us and we have no idea what drugs they're on because it's not been written down in the referral letter. So all these very simple things about what has happened. Is the patient at high risk from getting urinary tract infections? So if it's referred in from a nephrologist or a geriatrician or whatever, they know these things and they should be telling us whether we need to take precautions because we don't routinely use antibiotics in urodynamics. Now, in terms of quality of the actual tracings, this is key. And I'm not going to go through this great list, as you'll be pleased to know, but there are very simple things, like how do you set the machines up? And when you're measuring bladder pressure and rectal pressure, you zero to atmosphere. And this is a fundamental rule in physiological measurement, is you measure the real pressure. Now, despite this being a statement by the International Continent Society for years. When we look at these traces coming in from all around the world, there are some countries who persistently zero to the patient. So at the beginning of the test, P, the bladder pressure, the rectal pressure, and the trajectory pressure all measure zero. Well, of course, that's nonsense because that's not physiological measurement. That's fixing it. It looks nice, they like it because it looks nice, but it's completely misleading. And here you can see one of the traces that came in on our study. Here, you can just about see that the, here we've got, the, um, we've got the bladder pressure here, which is zero. We've got the abdominal pressure, the rectal pressure, which is zero. And we've got the detrusor pressure, therefore, which is zero. What you can't see is that the pressure, the abdominal pressure here goes down below zero during the filling, and that, of course, is nonsensical. So setting up the machine wrongly means that you have wasted your time with the patient, and worse still, you've wasted the patient's time. 
Now, when we do urodynamics, of course, the principal aims are to define detrusor and urethral function during filling and voiding. Now, one of the things we went over yesterday was to emphasize how simple urodynamics really is. So, I describe it as the four diagnoses of urodynamics. What do you want to know at the end of the test? At the end of the test, you want to know what's the bladder doing during filling? <coughs> what's the urethra doing during filling? What's the bladder do doing during voiding? And what's the urethra doing during voiding? And I suggested to, to our attendees yesterday that this is something they could have a discussion they could have with any intelligent person who would be able to answer these questions, whether they're medical or non-medical. But sometimes in medicine we over-elaborate, and this obscures the simplicity of what we're trying to do. So if you think about normal function, it's obvious what normal function is. It's obvious that your bladder has to be relaxed during filling, it's obvious that your urethra has to be closed during filling, and when you void, it's obvious that your bladder has to contract and it's obvious that your urethra has to relax. Therefore, if you know what normal function is, you know what abnormal function is. So, we said yesterday that, of course, the only abnormalities that you can have, by and large, of the detrusor during filling, the only abnormality you can have is it's overactive, it's because it's supposed to be relaxed. The only abnormality of the urethra you can have during filling it is that it's incompetent and the patient leaks. When it comes to voiding, the only abnormality of the detrusor you can have is that it's underactive or perhaps doesn't contract at all. And the only abnormality of the urethra you can have is that it doesn't relax or even if it relaxes, there's something in the way, like an obstructing prostate. So we tried to emphasize that a lot of urodynamics is actually quite straightforward. And when you're teaching it to your students, then we need to emphasize uh, the simplicity. It's not really for diagnosis, is it? Because you also want to know a bit about whether the patient can feel bladder filling, etc. You want to know what the capacity is, and you want to know what the post-void residual is. So the common indications are pretty obvious, I think, in women with stress incontinence prior to surgery, in women with other bothersome symptoms, in men usually looking at whether there's obstruction, and in both men and women, those who have persistent OAB, how are we going to treat them? We need to prove that there is detrusor overactivity, and in those patients refractory, uh, refractory to various treatments or still in problems after invasive treatment, then obviously urodynamics is indicated. Generally, we do basic urodynamics without video studies. And we emphasized yesterday that this will fulfill the needs of 90% of all the patients we see. If you're a big referral center, then you may need to consider setting yourself up with video urodynamics. So, that these technical skills and these clinical skills are really important and we need to think separately about them. Does my unit have good technical skills? Does my unit have good clinical skills? In terms of general recommendations, then we would say that urodynamics, although it's become widely accepted, still has no proper basis of regulation and training and it needs that. The patients need us to need that because as I say I can assure you that worldwide this is not satisfactory and therefore we would say that all urodynamic staff should undergo formal training. Uh, we think that units should be accredited and we're working with NHS England to develop a mandatory system so it will be just like a lab that's doing biochemistry or the radiology department, that we are properly accredited. That, of course, will elevate our status, which is, again, very important, particularly if we're asking for money. If the government looked at the way we do urodynamics, they might say, gosh, this is chaotic, you know. Is it really worth the money? Well, in some units, it's not worth the money because they're wasting money, they're getting diagnoses wrong because they don't really know how to do it properly. So that's a legitimate question that government and politicians might ask us. And of course, politicians love to beat up doctors 
in England at least. Is it the same in India? Yeah, so, because they're jealous of us. That's basically, I think, that's what I will always tell a politician. You're jealous of us because the public trust us, the public don't trust you. And you hate that. You really hate it. Um, so, Eurodynamics uh, should have a properly qualified director running the unit. And of course, historically, that might have been the senior consultant who might never have done much Eurodynamics. He might have watched a few. Uh, and that person really is not suitable to direct a modern Eurodynamics standard. So we need these people who have these essential skill sets. So are Eurodynamics the solution to investigating lower urinary tract dysfunction? Yes, they are. And I couldn't practice without it. But only if there is an appropriate indication. Well, that's okay. Sometimes patients come to the aerodynamic lab and I send them away. I don't say your doctor's an idiot to refer you. I say, well, there maybe aren't such great benefits for you having aerodynamics. So one of the fundamental things is if we make a, a judgment that you've got prostatic obstruction, are you willing to have a prostate operation? And if the patient says, no way, I'm not going to have surgery, there's no point in doing the urodynamics, and we send the patient home. And if it makes the doc referring doctor a bit fed up, well, so be it. But at least it educates the referring doctor. And that education cycle, I think, is really important. And one has to be you know, quite careful about that. We need to improve the, qual sorry, we need to improve the quality of the urodynamics. Uh, by following the recommendations from the ICS and now these new, new ones from the UK Continent Society. Technical quality, vital. Clinical interpretation, vital. We, sh we should note and we should publicize that there are no regulatory standards because if our patients knew this, they would apply some pressure. But I think in the meantime, I hope that the USI and the British Association of Urological Surgeons will take the lead. Now, in the UK, I managed to persuade uh, BAUS that all trainees have to do some urodynamics. So the oncology trainees have to do urodynamics. And I say that's really important because you oncology trainees, you will make men incontinent by your radical prostatectomies. You need to understand uh, how to sort that out. I don't want you sorting it out. I want you to be referring these patients to me. And they have come into it and actually they've said, this is really interesting, I understand now bladder and urethral function, I can manage my oncology patients better than I could before. So that's important. All men have LUTs eventually, so it's applicable to all urologists. So hopefully um, we can go forward from this and thank you very much indeed again uh, for inviting me to Manipal, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, and I look forward to visiting again. Manipal, for me, is a perfect place because I don't like really big towns. So here, you've got countryside, and as you can see, you've got the sea, and, and a very modern piece, a beautiful sculpture of a fishing family down on the beach just close by. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Pal. And we had a very good idea about the uh, actually entire spectrum of how to set a lab and what are the initial things which one should do yesterday. I think it was a beautiful course. Everybody appreciated that. And with that, we'll start our next session. And may I invite Professor Nitin Kekre to present his. Thank you. Very good morning to all of you. And at the outset, would like to thank Dr. Anish and Dr. Chawla for inviting me to participate in this uh, low inner tract dysfunction and neurodynamic session. Yesterday it was a great day for all of us because all the hard work was being done by Professor Paul Abrahams and we were keenly listening and learned a lot. In fact, my own learning and in interest in neurodynamics, uh, we were a unit here way back uh, in Valore. We always used to do neurodynamics. So Ganesh had come back from Newcastle and then when I worked there in Newcastle, they were involved in military monitoring and urodynamics and basically to understand that low urotract dysfunction is very simple thing provided you pay attention to simple things. That time two units which are very big, one was Newcastle unit and another was the Bristol unit which had a, Paul Abrams was the leading 
So, and he is responsible for so many changes today that the topic we are talking about today, we are not saying prosthetism. We are saying lower urinary tract symptoms, a term coined by him. And we don't recognize the value of this particular terminology because it has, it has taken, a, I think, I don't know how many years to disconnect this notion from a medical community's mind that every elderly man who comes with urinary symptoms has prostatism or a prostate problem. That is what when we did MBBS, we used to believe that any elderly man comes, urinary symptoms, he's got a prostate problem. So this disconnection has been achieved by using a terminology called low urinary tract symptoms. We understand today that the low urinary tract symptoms are age related. They are common in both men and women as we age. So certainly it is not related to only prostate. As we clearly know that the histological BPH is very prevalent. But not all the patients with histological BPH are going to get prostatic enlargement. And not all prostatic enlargements produce bladder, benign prostatic obstruction. So this particular concept that among the low attack symptoms, even in elderly men, are not always related to prostatic obstruction. It is very, very key to understand that today the LUTs or low attack symptoms when the patient comes to us is probably multifactorial. And as a urologist, we need to develop that insight because many times it will be a medical problem which might be causing the low attack symptoms and investigating him or treating him for prosthetic so-called disease is probably a wrong way to go about it. So it is very, very important that this particular concept and we are so grateful for people like him who have been for years worked on this concept and today we are beginning to understand and looking at it more clearly. Some important definitions are important because for guideline purposes that we need to know what are we talking about. For example, uh, what is when we say lower tract symptoms, I still hear even during examinations or even when the senior colleagues sometimes are talking about, they will say, oh, he has got obstructive symptoms or he has got irritative symptoms. I think we need to realize that these are wrong terminologies. It is very, very important to stick to correct terminologies. So the terminologies which the guideline people use or the International Continent Society has given is very clear. You have storage symptoms, which can be frequency, urgency, urgency, incontinence. You have avoiding symptoms, that is hesitancy, flow, flow, intermittency, or straining to void. And you have post-maturation symptoms like dribble and a feeling of incomplete evacuation. So it is very, very important that we use these terminologies rather than giving a connotation that this is obstructive or irritative, which probably is not meaningful. So some important definitions, acute and retention, I think we all know, we call painful, palpable, bladder, when the patient is unable to pass urine. What is chronic retention? It has been defined for the purpose of the year. And as I said, I'm going to do basically this on European guidelines because that's what we follow. Non-painful bladder, which remains palpable or perspicacal after the patient has passed urine. Now this particular definition, I had some issue and which I'll put it to uh, Professor Paul Abraham, that in today's time, is it right to rely on the diagnosis of so-called chronic retention on two clinical skills which are where's a palpability or pergasibility which are comparatively very low uh, positive predictive values for example if i do an ultrasound on a patient and who has a persistent residue of 350 but is, i can't palpate his bladder or i can't percussive his bladder is that okay because it does not come into this definition so that's the question which I think we would like to ask to him and hopefully we'll get some answers from him. So it is important that we understand this and bladder outlet obstruction. During voiding, obviously when you say obstruction, it comes with urodynamics because that's the only way one could diagnose bladder outlet obstruction. So it is very high rise, destrusive pressure, low flow, bladder outlet obstruction. Benign prostatic obstruction, that is when you feel that the bladder obstruction is because of prostatic enlargement, then you call it benign prostatic obstructions. It's very, very important to understand this definition and use them correctly. Detrusive overactivity is a urodynamic diagnosis. So you don't say to somebody based on the symptom that you've got detrusive overactivity. It has to be urodynamically documented. If you have a symptom complex, you call it overactive bladder. So it's important that these fine nuances are looked at. Now I come to the guidelines, then why do we need, gui need guidelines? I think the guidelines are an important way that we actually want to have a practical evidence-based 
clinical practices. It is not possible for an everyday busy clinician to go through the, all the available literature which gets published in huge number nowadays and understand meaningful things. So for that, the guidelines do help you because they, and also once you start practicing a particular guideline in a particular society or in a country, you bring in a sort of a uniformity in your practices. So that tomorrow, one can audit a practice which we have followed and understand whether that was good enough or not and also it carries a direction for a future research. And it's very, very important to, and because of that, Making a guideline is a serious business. As you look in the hierarchy of evidence, the guidelines comes very high. Number two, why? Because it is a critical appraisal of the available evidence. It is not surveys. It is not that you send letters to all over India to people, you know, what are you doing? And you come back and you form a guideline. That's not a guideline. Guideline making is a serious business where people who are in con concerned in that particular speciality get together, go through the all the available evidence, they collate, they grade the evidence, the quality of the evidence, then they go through it and then they discuss. And after thorough review of such a literature, then they come to you with a particular set of guidelines. So it is so, so important to understand that the guidelines, when they come out, that is the reason why people are willing to follow it. Because we know it is based on some proper evidence-based medicine. So it is very, very important to remember this. and. The basis of recommendation takes into consideration many things. It says quality, magnitude of the effect, certainty of the particular intervention or drugs or a practice. It also looks at desirable and undesirable outcomes of that intervention and of course most important, its impact on the patient's values. So it is very, very important that all these factors are factored into before making a guideline. So I now come to the basic thing about the LUTS guidelines and I'll go one by one. What I have done is I have taken the 2019 European guidelines as a basis because they just come out and many of you may not have had a chance to actually go through it. From 2018 to 2019, there have been very minor changes. For example, TUM, TUMT and thermotherapy has been removed from the, from the guidelines and there are some recommendations on basically newer treatments have been mentioned under investigation like robotic ablation and other things but they are still under investigation but apart from that there is no great change between 2018 to 2019 eau guidelines so the first is diagnostic evaluation and these particular guidelines are only applicable to male non-neurogenic low neurotrack tract symptoms so it is very very important that if your patient has a neurogenic symptoms there's a different set of guidelines and you need to follow them. So it's basically the index patient for these guidelines is a man over 40 years of age who has low urinary tract symptoms of non-neurogenic nature. Now when it comes to the diagnostic evaluation, what do we do we first? History. I mean all of us as a medical student know that we can't proceed without a history. Do we need actually an evidence for it? I guess no, but it is important that we should know what we should always include in the history for a low urinary tract. And it is important that we should take cognizance of all his comorbidities, drugs, and more importantly, sexual function, which usually people forget that now more and more research is coming in and telling us the association of urinary tract symptoms with sexual dysfunction, which ultimately may relate to metabolic syndrome, may relate to ischemia. The further research will carry. So it is important that we actually pay attention to these things in particular history. So it is, for example, this 60-year-old gentleman, BMI 30, he has got obstructive sleep apnea and has low tract symptoms, especially nocturia. So it is important that we realize that this is probably related to his uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And that is what would require treatment rather than give him anticholinergics. So it is very, very important that we pay attention to certain important aspects of the history. So what do the guidelines say? The another important thing as you see the pattern of the guideline that they give you the summary of evidence. The summary of evidence gives you the level of evidence which they have looked at. So if you look here, the summary of evidence, the evidence is level 4, poor level quality evidence because nobody did studies for this. But recommendation means what did the, the experts feel? That they, whatever their recommendation comes with a strong recommendation means it is unlikely to change in near future, most likely. While weak recommendations probably mean that there is a possibility that this recommendation will keep changing with time. So here, what did the committee feel? They felt that the medical history is of course an integral part and complete history of man with LUTs, a very strong uh, recommendation from the uh, guideline. Now question is, one of the part of the history is questionnaire. 
we all use ipss there is a icq mlutis uh, questionnaire which also has a nocturia included into it which is not there in the ipss so slowly i think the icq which is now available almost in 17 languages will get more properly adopted and hopefully we will be slowly in future replacing this with uh, IP, the IPSS may get replaced with this will take some time so it is important that whatever you are practicing you use a validated questionnaire the most important thing is validated questionnaire in your clinical practice and so the summary of evidence again level 3 evidence that the symptom questionnaires are sensitive to symptom changes symptom scores can quantify LUTs. Important that we are quantifying, they are not diagnostic. You can't, on the basis of symptom score, make a diagnosis of prosthetic obstruction. It is just quantifying the level of bother, what sim predominant symptom has, and there is a very strong recommendation that we must use a validated questionnaire, either IPSS or ICIQ. Now, what about voiding diary? Yesterday, we had a very good demonstration of this, and all of us who are urodynamically oriented, I personally feel this is one simple test which gives you so much information which are, and so valuable. But you must understand what are you doing. There are many times people use these terminologies not clearly. For example, if you just record the time and the, it's just a chart. If it's a frequency volume, it requires, it also records the volumes voided at every time. But that may not give you the, all the information and the all information, especially when you deal with uh, incontinence, is bladder diary. And this is the validated bladder diary, which we saw yesterday also, which records everything. It records the times of micturition, it records the voided volumes, incontinence, pad usage. So basically, the entire sim symptom complex, which is important for us to know, can be recorded in the form of a bladder diary. So what is the evidence? The evidence is almost a reasonable quality evidence how often, how long we should maintain. And they say three to seven days frequency volume chart is probably what is recommended. So minimum three days, but sometimes even if it is 24 hours, it's okay, but at least an attempt should be made to have a voiding diary. So what is the recommendation? Use bladder diary to assess male LUTs with a prominent storage component or nocturia. Tell the patient to complete a bladder diary at least for three days. So that is the recommendation based on the evidence which has been synthesized. Now what about DRE? I mean, I guess all of us have been taught we must do a DRE and I don't think that whether evidence or no evidence because we know we need to know the size, we need to know the consistency of the prostate and all of us will do a DRE. But it is important to understand the limitations of the DRE. And the limitations of DRE is it underestimate the size of the prostate and a normal prostate gland does not rule out prostatic malignancy. So it's important to recognize that there is a limitation of DRE, but it becomes, still remains an important. And as you see here, the recommendation is perform DRE in an assessment of male LUTs. So we, we definitely, there's no doubt about that. Now the question which comes is, should we do urine analysis? What has a low urinary tract symptom to do with urine analysis? Though we believe that the urine is the only way which the kidney or the urinary tract communicates with the outside world. And we believe that urine has an important information. But if you look at an evidence, in a hundred number of patients, hundred patients presenting with LUTs, how many of them will have abnormal urine microscopy? So probably it, the percentage may be low, but still, whatever we may find, that actually is very important. So it is important that we must do a dipstick urine evaluation be first and if there is an abnormality then you go and submit them to urine microscopy. So that is what is the recommendation is use urine analysis dipstick in the assessment of male LUTs is a very strong indication. The next is PSA. I mean we know PSA is controversial and I have been speaking so called against PSA in this country for many years and I still believe it is one marker which has caused more harm than actually benefit. And, but it has a great correlation with BPH actually. In fact, Thomas Tamey, when he wrote that article that PSA era is over in USA, he said the same thing. He said the, P, the volume of prostate cancer was not correlating at all with the prostate cancer, but rather was correlating with the benign prostatic hyperplasia. So PSA is a good marker because it does give you an idea about the size of the gland. It also is a predictor is a dynamic predictor about the progression of the of the BPH LUTs due to LUTs and the need for treatment. So PSA does give you some purpose, but should it be done? So what they say, measure PSA if a diagnosis of prostate cancer will change the management. So obviously if a young man, if you make a diagnosis and if the treatment is going to be radical prostatectomy, I think it might be important to do, but routine PSA probably may not be necessary. 
major PSA would assist in the treatment or decision making process basically the same thing so again it depends on you and your patient is with the comorbidities and other things to decide whether you should ask for a PSA renal function assessment again we know that in our country can we follow this advice for example what is the recommendation we know that the renal function patients who have chronic retention, hydronephrosis or other comorbid factors that they have a renal impairment. Not every patient with LUTs probably has a renal impairment. So it's possible that we may be over assessing, over doing this particular investigation in our setup but many a times in our setup that many times this is the first clinical visit of a patient to a doctor. We do not have a general practice GP where patients are being looked after in a primary health care. So recommendation like this we need to be thinking about. If the patient is coming for the first time, it's not uncommon. I'm sure you would have seen patients coming with severe urinary frequency. And you ask him, have you got diabetes? No, I have no diabetes. And you send the urine for examination, come three plus sugar. Then you go and do his sugar is 400. He never not aware of it. That does not happen in a developed world. So we, we kind of live in a different environment. So if a patient comes to us, to me, it makes more sense that I will do definitely the renal assessment whether the guidelines say or not. But here, the European guidelines, what is the recommendation? The recommendation is assess renal function if renal impairment is suspected on the history, clinical examination, hydro or other things. So it is important that whenever we look at a guideline, we must use our own common sense to decide whether that particular guideline makes sense in our clinical scenario and not follow it blindly. Now we come to the evaluation, flowmetry. All of us urologists do flowmetry. And you know, we, as I said, we can't even think of doing uh, any surgical intervention without doing at least a flowmetry. But what is the evidence? The evidence is if you have a flow rate less than 10 mils per second, you have a specificity of about 70% and sensitivity of only 47% for bladder rot rot obstruction, a positive predictive value of about 70%. Obviously, if you lower the threshold of flow meter, flow rate, in an elderly population, your specificity may increase. So similarly, if the flow rate increases to 12 to 15, your specificity will come down. So the, though it's a useful investigation, it can't discriminate whether the low flow is because of an obstructed voiding, high pressure, or an underactive detrusor. So that's the limitation of flow. But if you have a other parameters present, it does help you in clinical decision making. So what is the recommendation on flow? It says flowmetry in the initial assessment of a weak recommendation. So basically they are saying it's not necessary to do it first time, but perform your flowmetry prior to medical or invasive treatment. So if the patient's symptoms course has got very mild bothersome symptoms and you're not, then you may not do it, but otherwise anytime you want to do medical, start a medical treatment or want to do an invasive treatment, I think there is a strong recommendation to perform a flow rate. post wide residue. I also raised the issue about it. So what is, how do we measure uh, post void residue? Mostly all of us probably today measure it by ultrasound. Very rarely one would catheterize a patient to measure a post void. What is significant PVR? The European guidelines have kept a criteria of 50 ml. Is 50 ml, what about 45 ml? Or what about, so you know, these are the issues. What is the relationship of a post void residue to pre voided volume? For example, if a person has voided, had held 600 and he voids, does that make a difference on his PVR? Should we do only one PVR or it should be like a flow rate? Should we do it three times? These are unanswered questions and so that is why I think the value of this investigation which is significant but when you put it on a statistical test they don't come around because the studies have not been done with this particular thing in mind. So it is important that we n need to understand the limitations of a post wire residue but still cannot remains the important fact that a presence of persistent residue is indicating of bladder dysfunction, whether it is obstruction or underactive detrusor needs to be decided. But I think it remains an important investigation and we will always do it along with the flow rate and I'm sure that's what most of the people would do. So what is the recommendation? The recommendation is major port wire residue in the assessment of male LUTs. I think which made sense. So it is very, very important but recognize the limitation of a post wire residue assessment. Imaging. Way back when we were studying, everybody used to do IVU for then the um, uh, Singh and Blandy paper which looked at from, from, from UK, we showed us it's unnecessary. And now today, none of us perform a protracted evaluation unless there's a specific indication. So there are same thing here, perform ultrasound, but here the difference which has happened is there's a weak recommendation which is saying perform ultrasound of unitrat in men with LUTs. 
So this is a weak recommendation. I don't think we perform on everybody, but there are a lot of people who perform screening ultrasound on everybody. So that you need to decide. What about prostatic imaging? Should we image prostate gland? It's very common nowadays. Everybody has an ultrasound and the gland comes 60, 80 grams, 100 grams. Important to know is if you do that, you must know that overestimate the size of the gland by at least 50 percent. So my simple formula is the transabdominal ultrasonographer said 100 grams gland, I think it is probably 40 to 50 grams gland because it is not very good at measuring the prostate size. Trust, transabdominal ultrasound is, eh, sorry, transrectal ultrasound is superior. So what is the recommendation? Should we do it? Perform imaging of prostate when considering patient for medical treatment for male LUTs. If I assist in the choice of appropriate drug, it is based on the so-called combat studies or thing, where we know that if you want to include 5 or 5 reductase with an alpha blocker, if the prostate volume is probably more than 40 ml, then only it is helpful. So because there is a limitation of a DRE and if you are very specific to know before starting the combination treatment, I think it will help you to assist whether you should put him on combination or you should only put him on an alpha blocker. Perform imaging of the prostate when considering surgical treatment and it's a strong indication. Here, I'm personally not sure that how much that helps unless I'm worried about a very large gland. You know, I'm having 80 grams, 100 grams gland, my clinical examination, I'm not sure. But in a small gland, I do not know whether I really need an imaging of a, a prostate gland and how it will help me. So that's something which can be debated. VCUG, they have mentioned it, nobody does it and there's no question of and the same thing, it is, uh, sorry, it is not recommended. Now what about urethrocystoscopy? Should we do cystoscopy prior in every patient when it came to LUTs? Obviously, the answer is no. We don't need to do it unless there is a suspicion of something else. For example, there is a, there is a microscopic hematuria or something which will change your management. Your routine cystoscopy adds nothing in the evaluation of male LUTs. So perform urethrocystoscopy in men minimally prior two minimally invasive surgical therapies if the findings may change the treatment. Otherwise, it's probably not necessary. Eurodynamics. We all just had a wonderful lecture on Eurodynamics. We know that benign prostatic obstruction can only be defined by Eurodynamics. So frankly speaking, if we take this forward, the concept should be that if you are willing to operate only for benign prostatic obstruction, then you cannot do it unless you do Eurodynamics. But the problem is the available literature does not support that to such an extent that this can be made into a guideline. Many times absence of evidence does not mean that it is not there. It is the question is probably we need to design studies better to make sure and answer that question. But as of now, basically what is the recommendation on urodynamics? Th there are no RCTs in men with less than possible BPO. That's the problem. So it is very difficult to, to make any. Uh, so what is the recommendation? The recommendations are vague and weak, as you say here. There's a full perform PF studies only in individual patients for specific indication prior to We know patient has neuropathy, patient had a stroke, patient with Parkinsonism. So we all know that this standard investigation where when we have a doubt that it can be a confounding factor which can change my diagnosis, you must do. Rest indications all but look at the column on the left. All the indications for the urodynamics, the recommendation grading is weak. So it is possible that it may change and there where the practices change in our clinical practice. But basically if you are a person who wants to avoid unsatisfactory customers following TURP, whenever in doubt, it's better to do pressure flow studies. But that's the guideline, not, uh, that's guideline are different. What about non-invasive tests? Should we be doing non-invasive tests in the assessment of male LUTs? And the problem is there are very f few sets of data, few studies are available which are not as reliable, robust, so no definite recommendations can be made on this. And that is what they say, do not offer non-invasive tests as an alternative. They are not an alternative to routine urodynamic testing. So it is important to remember that they still remain in the realm of research and studies rather than a routine use in our clinical practice. Now after going, so this is what about the evaluation of a male LUTs and now the question comes about management. When it comes to management, what do we do? Watchful waiting. Is it a treatment option to be considered? Obviously. Patients were less bothered, minimally symptomatic, there is no need to put on medication. Why? Medication have adverse effects and in a country like India, 
they have a long term economical effect it's not easy the tablets are not cheap and if you actually ask your patient they themselves discontinue many uh, and they will take it like a prn basis because they can't afford it so it is important that we should be sure when to start the treatment so basically it is the conservative treatment is or again the data is saying that many times the during the management of this patient the symptoms get less and they no longer require treatment so it is important to consider this in mind and so the recommendation is offer watchful waiting to mild and moderate symptoms it is less bothered offer men with lifestyle changes prior or concurrent with treatment so basically there is a lot of place for conservative treatment in the management of elderly men with luts alpha blockers we all know we all use them especially for small prostates and i don't think there is anything changed in the evidence to what we and already know so i'll just go back and say yes it is offered to men with me severe moderate to severe as a first line of treatment as long as their prostate is not bigger than 40 grams in size five alpha hydrolase inhibitors we know they reduce the prostate volume we know they are useful for patients who have more than 40 ml so patients with 40 ml combination treatment as we know or symptom alone can be the five alpha reductase is offered because it is the only treatment which changes the natural history of the disease that is it has been shown to reduce the risk of retention it has been also shown to reduce the risk of requiring intervention so five alpha reductase is used as we are using and i don't think there is any change in the recommendation uh, on the five alpha reductase what about anti uh, anticholinergics we are using them in the patients who have storage symptoms along with uh, sto along with avoiding symptoms and they have been found to be safe and so the recommendation is same use them in a men with moderate to severe symptoms who have also have bladder storage symptoms but there is a warning and the warning is a weak recommendation that before you do that make sure that the patient's post viral residue is not there if there's a significant post viral residue it is possible that you might worsen their presentation there is no clear cut evidence that this will happen but you need to keep it in mind and use this as a caution so there is a weak recommendation to saying that be careful or do not offer uh, anticholinergics if the pvr is high what about phosphorylated by inhibitors there's a more and more role of these drugs coming in because of the understanding of the pathophysiology and believing that there is a role and it significantly helps toward the storage symptoms rather than voiding symptoms and of course there is a concomitant erectile dysfunction so the men who have this erectile dysfunction and lats phosphorylated by alpha reduct uh, sorry phosphorylated inhibitors would be useful and that is what the recommendation is that men with moderate to severe lats with or without erectile dysfunction so it is important that this can be uh, can be used the 5 mg tadalafil is now available in india and you can use it beta 3 agonist is a new kid in the block as far as is concerned excellent drug because it has the similar efficacy to other mascanic receptors but advantage is suppose you using in elderly men that probably it will not cause the cognitive impairment which the anticholinergics like oxybutynin and other things can produce because you have to use this term for long term there is a problem about that uh, cognitive impairment and so this drug also dry mouth will be substantially lesser so it is a good drug to be used Uh, whenever there is an indication, and they will say the same thing. That is a weak recommendation that it can be used for bladder storage symptoms. Combination therapy I have already dealt with. That that basically use combination therapy when the gland is more than 40 mL, and the recommendation is the same as unchanged for years, which is based on the previous studies. Same thing about anticholinergics. You can obviously use both alpha blockers with uh, anticholinergics. and again the same recommendation is there but very very important before you initiate pharmacotherapy you must have a discussion with the patient regarding the side effects sometimes you may not think that the side effect is important for you but that may be very important for the patient for example retrograde ejaculation may be very important for a man so it is very celodosin especially i am seeing lots of celodosin prescriptions today and the men have far more retrograde ejaculation when you prescribe them celodosin with a hardly any greater improvement than other alpha blockers but this happens the medical companies push a drug and it becomes a common drug for prescription without any great evidence that an a alpha blocker is superior to another we change to an expensive medicine without a particular reason any need for it so i think it is very very important that we discuss and understand the side effect and the cost profile before we prescribe a medication which the patient may have to take for many many years 
Now about surgical intervention, is anything changed? Not greatly because we all know TRP remains the gold standard for the operation, especially if the gland is less than 80 ml. It remains the same here. There is no change in that. What about so smaller glands? You can do anything. You can do TORP. You can do bipolar TORP. If you want doing laser, you can do everything. Again, what we have to look at it, what is cost effective for us? So it is very, very important that we look at cost effectiveness because the side effect profile is not, they are all, all the trials you see in this are non-inferiority trials. They are not superiority trials. So all the new dry, now all the new interventions show that it is not inferior which is not superior to TRP. So it is very, very important to keep this in mind. So what are the recommendations? Offer to your incision if the gland is less than 30 ml. You can offer our, our so-called TUIP, TORP, 30 to 80 ml, and bipolar transverse vaporization as an alternative to TORP, again, when the gland, and all these recommendations have a strong recommendation that they feel they're unlikely to change in near future. Open prostate we hardly offer, but there are days when you have 400 gram, 300 gram, that may be the still the treatment of choice. So it's a durable treatment, there's no doubt about it, except that it has a slightly higher morbidity. Endoscopic enucleation, that is a bipolar endoscopic enucleation, also is an effective treatment for large prostate. So large prostates, open prostate endoscopic nucleation or laser enucleation, whatever you have, have a reasonable good chance of succeeding and all of them have a good level of evidence to show that larger gland should be tackled if you have the availability by these means. So what is the recommendation? Endoscopic enucleation of the prostate to large prostate in place of open prostatectomy or open prostatectomy if you don't have that. So it is, there is no change in this particular recommendation. Lasers. Every six months or one year you have a new, new laser. A new laser, a new company will come and tell you that laser is better. The wattage has changed. It usually indicates that they are still not sure. We have still not reached the, the best of the laser yet. But yes, they are useful and nobody denies that that holmium laser has changed the scene, especially in larger glands. The, with a large gland you can enucleate and just morsel it. It is considerably less morbid maybe than an open prostatectomy. So w this is the Import, what are the recommendations? Enucleation of prostate, whole app to men with moderate to severe less as an alternative to open prostatectomy. That is when the gland is so big that you would only be considering open prostatectomy. Holmium is an answer. 80 watt 532 potassium uh, that KTP laser vaporization also has been said to be good results and there is a very strong indication for that that you can use that either. One to, the only laser which has been shown to be better hemostatically, I think, is a green light laser. The patients who are on anticoagulants are much better served with a green light laser rather than a holmium laser. So that is what they say, that basically on anticoagulant therapy, it is more useful. So it, these are, a, but that's a weak recommendation. What about prostra lift? It's a very common operation, especially in the West nowadays, a lot of people who want to preserve their ejaculation, they are, want to, so whom can it be offered? Yes. They say offer prostatic lift in men as long as their gland size is less than 70 ml and they don't have a median lobe. So no median lobe, gland size less than 70 ml, man very motivated to preserve his ejaculation, you can offer prostatic lift and there is a strong recommendation for it. So these are the limit uh, 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 guidelines which I thought were important and I included, but I would say we remember that the lim guidelines have limitations. Do not follow them as a gospel truth. And do not put your common sense out of window, your clinical experience out of window. Why? Because the surgical literature inherently is poor. I mean, I, I will always, always refer to this, that one, there was one BMJ editorial many, many years ago when the editor of the BMJ called the surgical literature a comic opera. So it continues even today, though we have got better. The RCTs and these words have come into the vocabulary of surgeons, hierarchy of evidence, level of evidence, at least we are talking about it. But most of the studies available are pretty biased. So there is a difficulty in the quality of literature on which the guidelines are based. That's number one. Then the international experts, however you are, you have a bias. Like for example, I have a bias about urodynamics. I may not have a proof, but I have a bias. I feel that urodynamics will be better. So all those things come into the guidelines and that it is difficult to, 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 to eradicate, though they try their best. So there are conflict of interest. There was a study about guidelines that how the conflict of interest guided a particular guideline. So it is important to remember that there are enough issues about the guidelines, but they still represent the best possible evidence you can go through and follow 
with your common sense and with your clinical practice. Thank you very much. Should we have our own guidelines for this country? He narrated so many things, areas where he identified and told us that most of what his Western literature says may not be applicable for our country and for our scenario. So that we probably will have to think in terms of making our own guidelines. But then he told the difficulty of making guidelines also. The important point is India being such a vast country with a wide ethnicity spreading all men from north to west and maybe north to uh, south and south, east to west. So many differences are there in the various way of our thinking itself. So is it possible for us to develop a guideline which can incorporate the sum and substance of the entire country as a whole? Or should we split the guideline depending on the area or prevalence or whatever that, uh, that particular thing is? An um, important aspect that I would like to add on to what he said is, he said, history taking and clinical examination are mandatory. Let me ask you in this crowd, how many of you really honestly raise your hand and say you are taking proper history and proper clinical examination? I can be bet that it will be very, very few. All of you will put up your hand, I know that. I know that all of you put up your hand, but you, which you don't do. That's exactly what I'm trying to say, that we are unfortunately come to depending ourselves on investigations and we place our treatment on investigation. I think I would like this answer to be answered by uh, Nizin before I throw the other thing open to everybody. About what, sir? About uh, the reliability of investigations. Uh, which reliability of? Investigations are the primary concern, not clinical examination. I think that I fully agree, sir, that the physical history at examination is the cornerstone. Today it is, uh, people don't do DRE, but they do PSA first. So that is the kind of a culture we have got into. And uh, it is, you can never, never uh, without a proper history. In fact, there are so many incidences, where I'm sure all of you can remember, where a low tract symptom presentation turned out to be entirely different and had a metabolic cause. And that is, would not have happened if enough attention would have been paid on the medical side of the patient. So it's so, so important. Yeah. Any, any questions from the floor? Uh, this is very interesting what you said, uh, because we have seen in younger population, parietal examination is omitted, not done, it is not there in record. And then, I think uh, eight, nine months back, North Zone uh, WhatsApp group, that of debate was going on, and most of the doctors were advocating that parietal examination is not required in the present era because of the investigation, you can make it out. So that's what the perception of the most of the doctors propagating and recommending not to do it, because if you don't do it, you are not going to miss it. So I was very surprised, tried to contradict it, but your voice was suppressed. <laughs> Any questions? I, I thought that was an excellent, excellent uh, discussion. Well, a discussion of the merit of guidelines as well, because it's, I, I, the, the two interesting recommendations from the EAU is that we should be using uh, PD-5 inhibitors. High level recommendations but low-level recommendation about using beta-3 agonists for overactive bladder. Now, in the real world, which I think is what well, you're talking about, in the real world, I don't know anybody who uses PD-5 inhibitors for male LUTs, unless the patient happens to have also erectile dysfunction. I don't know, I, I always ask at meetings in the UK and Europe, and nobody uses PD-5 inhibitors just for LUTs. But the evidence is very good, and that's the problem with the guideline. The guideline takes high-quality evidence, and when you look at the evidence for PD-5 inhibitors in LUTs, it's high-level evidence. It's a randomized controlled trial, well-conducted. But the gap in logic, I think, is that there was never a proof-of-concept study. So all the other drugs, like alpha blockers, finasteride, etc., all had a urodynamic study. And the idea was that we're using alpha blockers and finasteride to partially relieve obstruction. So that's a proof of concept study. But the interesting thing is that the FDA, you know, the American 
um, regulatory authority, they didn't ask for a proof of concept study. So we're all saying, well, how do PD5 inhibitors work? Anybody know? Actually, nobody knows. There's no good basic science. The theory is that actually they work on overactive bladder. So they work in the bladder to reduce overactive bladder, and of course that would improve male LUTs. That's got nothing to do with obstruction. So the studies that have been done on the PD-5 inhibitors don't show any difference in flow rate or in residual urine. So they're licensed for LUTs. They're no use, as far as I know, for prostatic obstruction. Now, if you take, if you take beta-3 agonists, Everybody uses those because everyone knows that clinically uh, they are available. Are they, are they, everything's available in India, isn't it? In every combination, yeah. So everyone knows that beta-3 agonists work, so they're used. But there aren't the good quality trials yet to show that they work. So you have this strange situation, don't you, with guidelines? And I think you, you put it very well. And so some of, the, some of the statements they make are really not based up by, with fact. And other statements they make to say that something is very good, actually, we don't really believe the evidence in some senses. Yeah, so it's very interesting. In terms of the retention one, about what's the, the definitions of... I think we know what acute retention is, don't we? Yeah, I know. We know what acute is. We're happy about acute retention, but, but I agree that chronic retention... And, and the idea of being able to feel the bladder, I think in English patients, most older men are fat. So actually you can't feel the bladder at all. So the only way you're going to reliably look at the bladder is with ultrasound. So I, I think the, the concept of, percu well, percussing the bladder I think works, but most people don't percuss anymore. I don't think, and actually I don't know, can you percuss properly you're our senior person here. I can't percuss with rubber gloves on. The thing is, the percussion test has been looked at, and it's got a very low uh, yeah. reproducibility as a test. So, to include criteria of percussion yeah. in the definition today, yeah. Yeah. to me, it looks a bit, bit old because men with that age have reasonable fat on their abdomen. It is not always easy to percuss bladder. No. And the bladder which you can percuss is then is regularly palpable. But then you miss out, in my opinion, in that definition, yeah. lots of bladders which will have residue, which may have a significant impact on the outcome of a prostatectomy if you don't take that into consideration. So I wonder whether there is a need to revisit this definition of chronic retention. I think the problem is that... Because what they describe is like overflow incontinence type. You know, patients have palpable yeah. bladder, those they say may or may not leak, but Palpable bladder is their uh, main criteria. Yeah. Well, I think the percussion bit came, and, and some people talk about 300 mLs, don't they? Yeah. So 300 mLs is the volume you need in your bladder. In a very thin patient, you can then percuss it when it's above 300. But as I don't ever have any very thin patients, it's irrelevant to me. And anyway, there's nothing magical about 300. It's an, ar it's an arbitrary number. But we like to know, don't we, if there's a big residual, and that affects our management, as you say. Yeah. Um, I, if I could just, um, what you mentioned about, you can't really assess the value of H percussion because it's not really scientifically shown. I think DRE also suffers with the same H disadvantage. And there are studies which have shown a lot of variability in the assessment by the same person doing the assessment at a different time and reporting at different volumes or consistency. And what, what Dr. Anand Kumar said, with due respect, DRE's PPV is also not very good. And that's the reason why there is a question mark that if you are not going to rely on it, anyway you are going to look at the size by ultrasound and the PSA is going to tell you whether you are going to biopsy or not then what's the point in DRE? I, I do. I do DRE. No, no. But I, I think I also see a point there that it may be on its way out because it really is, is not a, a... No, I think the important look at DRE is that there is a range. Beyond that range, it starts losing its value. 
For example, as the gland size starts increasing, then it loses its value from the assessment point of view. But majority of the glands which we see still fall in the range where the but volume the can be reasonably assessed. It doesn't make any difference. So, That's so the whole it is, point. It is, it is not only the size, it is also the consistency and further evaluation. Which Again, management point of view, so, it makes no difference. Yeah. So it is the question is whether it will, on asking on everybody, ultrasound, no, so detecting some patients with ultrasound is a debate. That's no, all. when you say it's a strong recommendation, on what basis is it a strong can recommendation? I, can That's I add the question. To, uh, when you do a rectal examination, you're not just looking at the prostate. It's, it's part of a comprehensive evaluation. Include, let's say you do the rectal exam and the yeah. anal tone is lax. We are Will it make a difference to what you're going to do? So no, no, no. I, I think let's not so mix up the issues. No, we I'm are now talking about LUTs and LUTs only. So LUTs I don't think we should really so that part way. Of we uh, we of should be looking at also the retina or we should be looking at the no, balding no, of hair or whatever. I don't think we are really interested I, in that part. I, I think we are part talking about the strong recommendation for DRE for LUTs. And I'm just saying that just as you are saying that there is not much evidence about percussion, I think the DRE also is now falling in the same same category. Maybe the reason may be that we are not exposed to assessment. You know, the doctors, junior doctors, or maybe are not doing enough PR, uh, rectal examination. There are so many of us, and the patients are so few. I, I don't know. Uh, well, I, I think uh, I would beg to differ here. We just cannot omit DRE from uh, our examination spectrum because the uh, all said and done, the specificity is 33 percent and the sensitivity is 40 percent for the nodule. Let me be very specific. Anybody presenting with LUTs, this is one of the concerns. And if you depend only on the PSA, PSA may be low and then we all know that despite a low PSA and a palpable nodule, you do go in for biopsy. So, despite a low specificity and sensitivity, we just cannot rule it out. We don't do trust in all the patients, right? So, I think that is my yeah, argument. Yeah, same thing I want I to ask? highlight. Same thing, thing I want to highlight is the protected examination, PSA value and presence of malignancy. We have seen number of patients. Now, we know there are many prostatic cancer sub-varieties, neuroendocrinal, small cell and others where PSA may not be raised and you will have a protectal finding. So, you will miss them if you do not see it. And I have seen patient, young patient moving around in the community, parectal not done and diagnosis was missed. Once parectal done, diagnosis was picked up. So, one I think, I think one of the more important things that I always believe, maybe I am too old to say this, that rectal examination is a must as well as all patients are concerned, especially adults when you go into the thing. And not only rectal examination gives you an idea of prostate, what are you talking about prostate? There are so many rectal conditions that can be picked up by rectal examination which may have a bearing on the urological field. Similarly, by rectal examination, you can see the anal tone, etc., etc., which may contribute to our understanding of the disease better. Why don't you do a simple test and dirty? Are you afraid of soiling your finger? Is that the way only reason why you don't want to do a rectal examination? I don't understand. I think Dr. Punawala's twice point is valid that when you put a test to a statistical analysis, that there are problems that you cannot say, but in that there is a lot of variation. And what you need to understand is that the prostate size after a particular size has a very good specificity. When the size increases beyond, then the prostate DRE starts looking, uh, losing its value in estimating the volume of the prostate. Even the transabdominal ultrasound suffers from the same. Even the transrectal ultrasound has a specificity, but it does not prove exact volume. So there, every test has a problem. What we are trying to do is, a recommendation should not be that tomorrow we start stopping doing DRE and start doing transrectal ultrasound. I think that will be a co neither cost effective nor a correct method to do. It's a simple test, requires no extra investment. It's like urine microscopy. If you look at the evidence of urine microscopy, same thing you will find. But then the cost actually overweighs the benefits. So a DRE in any situation overweighs all the benefits which you get, as Sanjay was very point lightly saying that when you do a DRE, it's only not a DRE. There are a lot of information you get which is so significant when you are managing a male LUTs. So I think that's the message that DRE should be done. Yeah. I just want to add one comment to that. I, you know, long back, about 20 years back, where a patient came to my clinic, my hospital, and we were, he was undergoing repeated urethral dilatation for LUTs. So I tried to do a PR 
and I found that he has got a chronic pressure in Eno. So we do parietal examination, it is not only to know, to diagnose a CA prostate. There are so many other uh, factors we come across. So we are going to miss those things. So it's very important to do a di digital rectal examination. And the volume of the prostate by digital rectal examination is not going to be of any clinical importance. My, if my finger is short, I might say it is a grade 3. If somebody's finger is too long, they might say grade 1. So I don't think you go for the size of the prostate. It is other other uh, diagnosis we might miss out. Thanks a lot. For any, if no, if there are no other questions, we'll close this treatment. I think it's T now, is it? Yes, I don't sir. know. Thank you so much. If that, I think yeah. Professor Ibrahim's on to say. Um, can I just bring up the question of questionnaires? You mentioned you, you, you are a good prophet. Did you know that? Because you said that the ICIQ MLUTs will increase in popularity. And in fact, we are just we've done a large study, two large studies, in which we have data for both IPSS and the ICIQ MLUTs. And the, I, the IPSS, of course, has no questions on incontinence, as you pointed out. And what, which symptom is the most bothersome for men? Incontinence, what a surprise. If any of us was wet, we'd be very fed up about it. We wouldn't mind if we had some hesitancy or we had to strain a bit or our stream was a bit slow. We wouldn't care about that. But I would care a lot about being incontinent. It's not in the IPSS. It's in the ICIQ. And what we've been able to show now, and it'll be published shortly, is that the ICIQ MLUTs predicts which patients will do badly from surgery by virtue of the symptoms which bother them before the operation, because it also has information on bothersomeness for individual symptoms, which again is very important because the patient wants us to deal with the most bothersome symptom, which is in, by and large are the overactive bladder symptoms and not the voiding symptoms. So uh, you are a prophet, yeah. Right, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nitin Kekre for an amazing session. Professor Abrams, a very active audience. Thanks a lot. Thank you, chairpersons.